In this video, I'm gonna talk about how do you even get your documentary made? Who am I? I'm Johnny von Wallström and my last film sold to Netflix. In this channel, I talk about documentary filmmaking. So if you're into that, please consider subscribing. But now let's start the show. Man, I don't even know, but I messed up there. Uh, nothing worked. I think I didn't loop the video or something. But anyway, we are here to talk about funding a documentary film, whatever that is. So at least it started the whole stream and uh, we're just gonna get into it. And the funny thing like with this whole funding is like I hated funding documentaries. Like it was the worst. And then now I'm quite fine with it. Now I know like how it works. So it's become easier. So that should come to some uh, people like a comfort or something. But the biggest problem in terms of like funding a film for documentary filmmakers, it's really just like you're too happy to make your film that you don't even care about it selling or wherever it ends up. So you're just passionate about your project, but you have no clue about what's going to happen next. And that's what I'm hoping to kind of get into today because I was the same like for years. It took a long ass time for me to understand like what you need to do. So sure, you, you know, you can have passion and you can do all that. You can make a film. A lot of people make their first film and then they don't make a second film. And that's because they don't make any money. So it doesn't become something that is sustainable. So even though like I hate the whole money game of all of this, but like it's crucial if you want to make films in the future. So that's what this is going to be about pretty much. Uh, but I just want to start by thanking the crowdfunding supporters because we launched a crowdfunding campaign yesterday and it's it's going good like the first time i launched a crowdfunding campaign 400 bucks it sucked like that tanked so bad but now it looks pretty good so all you 66 backers thank you so much um still got 38 days to go but i'm gonna talk a little bit about crowdfunding as we get deeper into this because it's pretty interesting because uh, i've done three of them and like this one i feel pretty confident that it's gonna go well for the two previous ones no clue everything felt like this can just go any way like it could just tank all of them i've done one successfully that's about like 10k or something or is it 13k yeah 13k and then one that was like 400 bucks so that sucked but yeah anyways yeah, but thank you link in the description if anybody want to check out like we got free courses discounted and all that there But how do you sell a freaking film to like whoever like first of all, where do you kind of launch a film and What opportunities are there for you? So I would say like festivals still they really do matter because the industry is there uh, but for me, like I've always valued the industry markets at the festivals much more than the festival itself. Because the festival, if you don't get into the biggest ones, like if you don't get into Sundance or Cannes or yeah, the massive ones pretty much. Uh, I'll just get more into that as we get into this. But without them, you don't really get the exposure that's going to sell the film. So you need like... You need sales agents. That's something you need to also get into the festivals. Yeah, it's a big industry with all of this. And then you have like the distribution companies as well that you need to target. Yeah, you get the VOD services like Netflix, which we sold to, but you also got like Amazon and tons of others. Yeah, and then you got the regular broadcasters. And if you're in like a lucky country like Sweden, you actually can get decent money from the broadcasters. So I wouldn't like shy away from that. Yeah, but then you also have like a conflict if you want to sell to Netflix you can't sell to a broadcaster early on because they take the rights and then like your project towards Netflix will be less interesting so there's a lot of things to think about yeah, but the list of like places to sell is massive you can sell like anywhere and it all depends on the project and what you're doing pretty much yeah, but drop questions uh, in the chat and I'll get 
through them as we go along here and try to answer anything I can about film funding and especially doc film funding. Um, so what you really need to focus on first is probably to map out the potential that your project has. Like where would you put it? Like what platform would you put it in? Uh, and what type of story? Like what commissioning editors? You need to map all those things out first. Uh, but let's just see who's here in the chat first. So Franco, welcome. Franco Padron. Savi Yu. Chris Cohen. Uh, who do we got? We got Duke Denver Film from Denmark. Hello. Igor from Russia. Peter from Portugal. Venezuela, Franco. Nice to have you guys here. So first of all, like festivals, I know I hate on festivals a lot, but the thing is that like festivals to get your film sold or funded or whatever is, it's a big thing, especially if you, if you look at selling a film, festivals are super important because the industry is there. And the way it usually works is that you would get into like a market of some sort. So there's a lot of markets like hot dogs in Toronto has a market, CPH in Copenhagen and IDFA in Amsterdam has markets. That's where all the commissioning editors, all the broadcasters, Netflix and all of those, they usually sit in a room and there's like a, either there's the central stage pitch where everybody pitches. So you have all the funders there and all the broadcasters and like everybody's there. So you sit in a room and this is something that you get just like you do in a festival. You apply to get into a program and show your film. It's the same with the festivals where you get to the industry markets. You're going to pitch your film to them at an earlier stage. So that's like a massive part of what I do is just look at like those markets and try to get into the right one at the right time for the project. Uh, just like last week or this weekend, uh, Andre was in uh where is it is it malmo or copenhagen i'm not sure but nordisk panorama which is uh, the nordic one and just had a talk there about like how we work and uh, how we work alternatively with like funding and youtube and all that for docs so just being there and being part of it even if you don't have a project that you're trying to fund is a really important thing just because of the networking and just opening up doors yeah, so I would say like the industry markets to fund your film is crucial. The festival in itself, like for us, Pearl of Africa was sold uh, in the festival market. Uh, like in, not in the market market per se, like doing the festival route, like having the premiere. We did a premiere in Toronto and then we did one in Amsterdam and that's when it sold to Netflix. But the thing that happened before that was that we went to these markets at like Sheffield Doc Fest and, and all those and pitched the project to a lot of people before it even was like funded. Uh, and eventually we got into a festival and that's when we could get funding. Because when you're like a newcomer, getting funded by your even your own like country commissioning editors, for instance, that support film, your film commission is super hard. Like you need a track record most of the time. So having a festival premiere at like the top tier festivals, for instance, like for docs, that would be like IDFA or yeah, Hot Docs. What else? Like Sundance, Cannes, like the top ones, Tribeca. Um, yeah, a lot of those like bigger than I would say Sheffield Doc Fest, which is like a good industry festival, but not so much like the, the one that will get you funded. It's not that type of festival. You need like a big premiere at hopefully like competition program. And if you get that, then that can open like funding opportunities, even though you've finished your film, pretty much finished your film. So think about that when you look at like festivals, they are super important. If you look at like Sundance, Berlin, Cannes, Venice, what else, Toronto, all of those are, are massive in the industry. And the reason for that is that the reviews like Variety and Hollywood Reporter and all those things, 
they come from having screenings there. So we got a review in Variety for my last film just because we were in IDFA. We did not get it in Hot Dogs. So it kind of depends on like what festival are you in and how do you pitch them. Um, and I think th those things, they, they drive sales, but they also drive interest from like distributors and all those things. So that's why like festivals are super important in that aspect. They're not so important though when you look at audiences. I would think that like for audiences, online is like better every time. You get so many more people just by looking like at a live stream or whatever, you get so many more people. Yeah, so that's interesting to see. Like you don't have festivals that are interesting for for audiences. Maybe they are for like the people that are there, but they're just like a couple of thousands. So compared to having something online, it's nothing. But then in terms of money, all the money is in the festivals. So it's a hard thing to pick. Um, but a failure that I see a lot of people do is just like premiere at any festival. You need to keep like your exclusive premieres. So world premiere, European premiere, North American premiere, etc. Those are like, that's what you have as something of value when you talk to the festivals. And the big festivals won't take your film uh, or at least don't put it in the main competition if you don't have that type of premiere. If it's not like a high profile type of thing. Um, like top films might get away with more, like top names, but not if you're a small time filmmaker, then it's like, it's not gonna happen. Um, but I think also like, if you can build an audience outside of festivals, then that will help you both at the festival and uh, like outside of that. You shouldn't be dependent on festival, especially for audiences, but it's a great place to try to build like a network that you can sell to uh, and build reach. Um, yeah, I think so. Like build reach in your network because you get a lot of introductions there and all that. So let me just check for some comments here. Let me see what we have. Um, Matt Piercy, have you dealt with or recommend taking shorts to local towns or news station? Um, this would probably be best for early work. Uh, I've wondered if that could lead to funds or help uh, follow stories further. <laughs> Not even Guardian and, and New York Times has money. So I would say like, if you wanna get paid, that's a, a really bad alternative. Uh, like from, I think both Guardian and New York Times has like 5K-ish deals for shorts. And that's you know not something that you're gonna cover your cost or anything for. It's good if you use it as a strategy for like, okay, this is marketing and promotion, that's why I do it. Or it's like, okay, I need to cover my expenses to shoot this, so I'll shoot this for them and then I can do this with the rest of the material, something like that then it makes sense, but it doesn't make sense for just like that thing. And especially like I've done so much PR and things. Uh, and I think when you look at it, even with like a review in variety or we had a vlog or blog vlog, both of them uh, on Huffington Post for a long time uh, during the process of making the Pearl of Africa and like, the traffic, sure, it was kind of fine, but the good thing was that we could like use that article and then market it on Facebook. And then having like the trusted source of having Huffington Post, that was worthwhile. But having it just posted there didn't drive a lot of traffic or attention in any way. Yeah. But we did win like some prizes off of being there just because other people found it and then they kind of picked it up and like it, it has this because okay, so if they have the right eyeballs on their channel, like we had a blog, for instance, that led to us winning a uh, Maggie Award uh, from Planned Parenthood in the US, just because we were uh, featured on a certain blog, which was like African culture blog. 
and just because you had that niche people were watching it and then that led to like okay they discovered the project and we were in competition with like vice and esquire and like big big brands and then yeah we were the one that uh, got that prize and it's crazy that you can do that as like a small independent company in sweden but it's possible to get those things but as money not so much uh, like it can be a good thing to create some bus but tiny tiny part of it <clears throat> uh, so i got this question here let me see because it's a bit long have you ever had or set aside a project or two because they simply lack the funding uh, when you first brainstorm them uh, let me see i may have missed this post but do you have some short list for main funding items that are filming uh, yeah actually if you want like we have a free budget template on learndocumentary.com so you could get that and that's like what we usually use as a standard budget but then you need to kind of adapt it to whatever your circumstance is. So check that out. But then like aside from that, like you put projects on hold for like a long time. I've had this project that I started shooting about like five years ago. And I think we never got any funding for it. It's this, like it's a fantastic project. I've been shooting it in like a suburb of Stockholm and uh, it's with this like gangster rapper and he's gone to jail now and it's this amazing like underground story in Sweden that like nobody can access uh, like it's just insane with like automatic weapons and all that and I just feel like this is something that you'd never see in Sweden like nobody has that access and I don't know how we stumbled upon it and, and all that but eventually we just got to know these uh, guys that were doing music and we started following their like rap careers uh, but now like that project has been on hold for a long time and just a couple of weeks ago like two weeks ago or something we pitched it to tv but then it's been like it was one id from the beginning it was only based on those characters and then now i've just like looked at okay how can i make this into something relevant and also that is like more personal so I just looked at like my background is pretty much like not that bad, but it's still like I come from a pretty uh, rugged background. So I've grown up in a lot of like drugs and, and all that. So I have that like experience and I might like look the part, but it's still like what I come from. So I just want to like go back to like my history as having lived that life. Now I live like a comfortable life, but having like connected his struggle because we follow one character and then connect that to like my way of being now and like how do you be how do, are you a good role model for your kids and, and that sort of thing and connect those two because this is like a 20 year old that we're following and then i'm like 35 ish or even older i don't even know I'm born 82 <laughs> but anyway that is something that evolves naturally and we pitched it now with a totally different ID than we pitched in the beginning. And that's usually how they evolve. Uh, and we've pitched it several times. All the time it's been interesting. But one of these guys just went like he went away, um, just disappeared, was threatened. It's like a gang war type of thing going on. So he just disappeared. And then we eventually like discovered him again and then started following him again. And it's just that something that happens and i think you need to go with it like either you sometimes you put it on hold when i shot the pearl of africa we just put it on hold for like six months while she was like in hiding because it was too sensitive to shoot during that time and then we went back and shot it and like some filmmakers would want to shoot exactly that but we were trying to make like a different film so you kind of need to like look at what type of story you're trying to to say uh, and yeah, that matters the most, I think, like what's true to the story. Um, Saulo Rivas, I'd love to hear your perspective on self-funding a documentary project. Uh, regarding the market for a project, do you ever consider local TV stations uh, and cable as a viable option or to distribute? Yes, I do. 
<clears throat> so film I just talked about that's just TV that's regular Swedish TV I think that you kind of need to look at like what type of project are you doing certain projects are like more international they fit more like Netflix if you have an American story it could fit on American channels and maybe others but I think you need to go after like the natural market for every film and for like we have two films that we're trying to make with Swedish TV and we're not trying to do them internationally because they don't have the international appeal like our film in Kino for instance so you need to kind of look at that and then see like how do you piece that together but then in terms of like self-funding I think that's like key if you want to make films and you haven't made a feature film or two or three self-funding is the way to go so I self-funded Zero Silence I self-funded uh, Pearl of Africa all of those came about that way and then eventually you get so far into the project that you actually can secure some funding none of them had funding when I started so like I think Zero Silence was like did we get f I think we got funded when the Arab Spring happened which was like two years into the project and then we got funded just because of the Arab Spring was like it's something that's current affairs type of thing and everybody wanted a project uh, for Pearl of Africa I'm trying to remember exactly how it worked out but I think I think we got a grant first like a 10k grant to make the web series we made then we made a web series and we made a crowdfunding campaign and then from that we had like a, a lot of attention we had like CNN and like tons of quotes to like put together uh, and a lot of PR so we used that to get a first development grant that development grant was probably like 3k or something and then we got another development grant that was like 7k or something like that and then from that we were just shut off so he just turned us down and then we got nothing so we had gone uh, like a far way into the project and had like no money no uh, salaries or anything like that but we self-funded it in terms of like okay we bootstrapped the whole first initial process uh, did like a whole web series that was I don't remember if it's like 25 minutes or something off of that 10k grand and then like we covered all the trips and everything ourselves just to keep shooting and keep having material all the time and then eventually the crowdfunding campaign it helped us to get funding to shoot in Thailand which was the last part we needed to shoot but then as we were like shut off we didn't have any money to f finalize the film or anything so then we went back to like self-funding everything like we had some funding to cover the expenses and then we have to self-fund it again to get to the stage where we get into a festival so eventually we had like a rough cut we applied to festivals we get into a festival and then that's when like we had self-funded it a year because it took a year to edit and then at that stage we could actually secure production funding to finish the film for the festival and that's when like okay we covered our expenses we got some uh, some money paid to us but probably not even because it was so expensive with like archive material and clearing all the rights so I don't think we got much out of that and then eventually like sold to Netflix tried to get some money back from that that's how that worked but I think if you if you in general you need to kind of bootstrap or like self fund the first one or two maybe even three films to get a track record and I'm talking feature films not short films because that's usually like wh what uh, funders are looking at like if you have just a debut type of film you need to attach like people that are experienced to your project to kind of go past the whole criticism for you being a new filmmaker so it's, it's really hard that way and if I was new I would definitely like expect to pay for three films but uh, and plan for it but then if like it goes faster if you get money for your first film fine but don't expect that to happen because then it's just gonna lead to like you not making a film or two films um, yeah 
is there too low of a budget? Anthony Wright asks. Um, I mean, the, there's a problem with having like too low of, of a budget because you'll just get like problems because you can't pay for things and, and that sort of thing. But I think you should always be like economic and try to keep it as low as humanly possible. But the issue that you, you get from having too low of, of a budget, yeah, and this is something separate, but when you claim ownership of your project, then you need to have a proper budget where you have all your time counted for because the ownership of your project is going to be depending on how much you put in. So if you want ownership of your project, which I've always wanted, then you need to have a lot of money invested in your projects. And I know for, for like narrative work um, or like fiction work, you shouldn't do that in the similar way. But in the doc world, I think it's crucial because all you have is, is ownership. If you don't get paid for films, uh, like if you don't get prepaid from a channel or something like that, you're the only one taking all the risk. And the soon, like a lot of people, they will put like a budget forward to whatever, whoever is funding them in the end. And if that's too low, then they take all the stake in your project. So they own it and you get what, like 10% because you put in like 10% own investment. For us, it's always been like, no, we put in everything. Like we have all the equipment, we have everything. We put all our time into that. And then if that's our own time, then we argue for that because that ownership is worth more to us than like having a low budget. But then you get a different problem from having like too much of like, as long as you can pay for it, it's fine. But you need to get the, the budget to even out to access the money. If it looks like your budget isn't like, it's not trustworthy, then nobody's going to give you the money. So it's just like, don't put it too high because of that. Um, but yeah, it can be too low, but that's just like, is that a bad thing when like you should probably have a buffer that like have it as low as possible and then have a buffer which is like a contingency post or something like that that would be like 15 percent or 20 percent or something yeah. but as long as you have that then like you probably probably are safe but i would like just see experience as the only way to make a proper budget because you need to know like what like unfortunate expenses occur uh, on every project because it always happens but let me let me just like mention how a film usually is funded so first of all there's a difference like between development funding and production funding and then you have like post-production and outreach like those things as well but mainly like development funding, that's usually like soft money. And that means that it's not money you have to pay back. It's not money that anybody is going to claim something from. Like it's, it's usually just to support the industry uh, in general. And that could come from broadcast. It could come from like film commissioners. That's the money that you really want as much as possible from because there is no stake involved in terms of ownership and all that. As soon as you go into production, it's a different beast. Like you usually need to pay back if your film is earning money and that sort of thing. Uh, and you can negotiate like on those things, but it, it's the soft money that you want first. So funding places, own investment. I talked about that, but that's just a way to, for us, bootstrap the first initial development phase. We always pay for that. We want to get to a stage where we have a trailer that's like sales trailer. Then we're fine. Like from that, we can actually get money. But that part you usually need to bootstrap. And then like grants from film institution or film boards. That's how we get usually the money. Uh, it depends on where you are. Some countries don't have any money. Uh, and it's usually really hard to access that if you don't have a track record. So for instance, Andre, my brother, he couldn't access that money if I wasn't a co-producer on Pearl of Africa because he didn't, he hadn't produced any film. I think the line in Sweden or whatever, like the criteria is two films 
you need to have produced to produce a film which is pretty damn hard so that kind of limits you yeah. but now he's fine like now he has a lot of support there and then you have art grants which is like good if you can access them but it's mainly if you have an art uh, degree or something that you can access them um what else development funding for tv or from tv that's actually like i think that's going away a little bit because you have so much competition and there's so uh, like little money and i think a lot of as, at least this is my uh, experience from it but most of the tv money seems to go to like well-established filmmakers while the film boards are more experimental and i don't know if that's true but in sweden that's the case um, and then you have like big grants like media co-production grants like for european companies and for scandinavians uh, scandinavians there are some and those co-production grants are like a higher end type of grant where you get more than one country involved usually like at least two but even more and then you can access also like soft money from different f like grant institutions that are like a, a mesh it's usually like european money for instance that are put in a pot and then it's redistributed to the countries that are part of europe uh, or the eu and then the, that money is is applied for from having like certain production companies that are eu based and you can access that that's a great way to access it they also have development grants which a lot of my friends at least apply for i haven't gotten it so i couldn't say that much about it but a lot of my friends have gotten it and they seem to love applying for it it's like 20 or 30 pages not that fun uh, you got a lot of people doing private investment, like private investors is a big thing. Um, you need to know somebody that has money for that, so that kind of limits you. Crowdfunding, big thing, but it's super hard if you don't have an audience built already. Like it's so slow and like it's hard, hard work. Uh, but if you do have an audience, it's awesome. Like that freedom is worth so much more. Um, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about how we thought about it this time around because it's the third time that we're doing it. Uh, and then you also have pre-sale, uh, which is usually like a broadcaster or somebody coming and saying, yeah, yeah I'm interested in buying this film. And then s for like proper productions, you would go with those pre-sales. You would go and you would loan the money f that you would get for like the pre-sale to make the film and they will get it back in a pre-sale that's usually how they would like risk it um, but yeah pre-sales they're possible usually happens in those markets uh, where you pitch but other than that it's pretty hard to get them um, and then like you have funding in outreach stage which is usually how to get your film out if you have for instance a film about uh, LGBT you could get a lot of LGBT grants just because they want to get it out in that community. Uh, and then you have the distribution companies as well that would put like a minimum guarantee out there for your film. And that usually happens for like either big uh, names or it would happen for like a big festival a success or something. That's usually how it works. So let me see if we got some more questions here. Franco Padron, I'm currently crowdfunding two short films. Uh, maybe you know the situations on my country. The civil lining uh, is we can fund a short film, uh, six days of shooting with thousand or fifteen hundred dollars. Was there a question? I don't think so. Matt Piercy, I'm still uh, very early in getting into this film industry, so I'm not sure that the idea is getting work and uh, okay. Oh yeah, this was the one that was answering. So okay, do you recommend shooting before funding or the other way around? I would say always shoot first. 
Yeah, I know a lot of people would disagree on this, but like if you don't shoot first, how are you gonna pitch? Like it's so difficult to pitch without a trailer. You need that trailer. If you have a trailer, you have like an upper hand on people. And like dock people, they suck at pitching and selling themselves. So if you have that trailer and you have some like pitch prepared, you will own that whole market because there is like the level is so low and people are so uninterested in just like learning how to sell anything or pitch anything. So if you can just learn that, then you're way ahead of most of them. And then there are like some brilliant people out there, but it's just so low, like the lowest is super low. And then you have like a mid, yeah, you just have a couple, I would say. In every pitch market, you have like three or four that are amazing. And then the rest is very, not so amazing. Um, do you have any suggestions for self-distribution? I think the hard part about self-distribution is that you, you usually don't make any money. And I guess self self distributed both of these, and like one sold the Netflix that actually made some money, but not enough to actually cover a whole budget or anything. But then the first one was self distributed, but also sold the television, which was like okay, so we covered the expenses for like having an editor, all those things, and and doing that, but we didn't get paid. Yeah. And the issue is that like to make money once you distribute it you need to have money you know, like you need to put money into ads and all those things for it to sell on like a, a VOD service like Vimeo on demand for instance or something if you have an audience then I would go self distribution all day like that totally makes sense but if you haven't built an audience I would say like avoid self distribution as much as you can because like it's it's really to, to me the thing is this either you go with like proper distribution whatever that is like any type of way like for us we self distribute it through an aggregator to Netflix that's one way of self distributing it could also be like um distributing it through a sales agent and then selling it to a lot of tv channels or it could be like you just selling to one tv channel like the level could be whatever uh, but doing that is one thing that's that's like the least amount of like thing you should do but if you can't do that if you can't sell it if you don't have a sellable product or whatever chances are you're not going to make any money uh, self-distributing so if you don't have like a big following because then it's a different case if you have a big following or if you can access that through like a community okay this film works in this community or for instance this film has uh, a potential in educational distribution yeah, but we've tried educational distribution as well and i know a lot of people that they do make like certain money off of it especially in the us and uh, north america but it's really hard to do that as well self-distributed self you can buy lists for instance uh, for uh, universities and that sort of thing you can get some sales but we tried that really with the pearl of africa and we didn't feel any traction and we had like a list of like twenty thousand emails uh, and contact details and we didn't get like enough money off of it like we bought the list for like 1500 or something like that uh, us dollars so it wasn't free so we had like expenses we i think we went like even out or something in the end so we could have put more money into it and all that but i would say like if you can build an audience if you can do like crowdfunding if you whatever you can do to build an audience around your project to become like in a position where you actually have somebody that wants to to see your film then it's a different thing but you need to create that buzz around your project and like even a big like Sundance winner like what films do you know from Sundance last year I don't know any so like not even those you know the name of even those need to be marketed and that's the problem like you need money for that um, and so I would say like if you can build an audience 
do self-distribution. Otherwise, like just do it to get a track record. Don't like try to earn money off of it. The biggest importance in like a project that won't get distribution is to just get it out there somewhere to have a track record. So if you can get one channel to buy it, then that's better than self-distributing it because you're building like a, a, yeah, a resume of some sort for applying for the next film. That's how I would see it all the time. Like this film is just to get you to make the next one and next one. I uh, hope that makes sense, but yeah. Why not Indiegogo? Why did you should choose Kickstarter? Um, this is pretty interesting because I did Indiegogo for the last campaigns, but Kickstarter is, is bigger, I think. Uh, but mainly the thing was that we built a relationship with Kickstarter uh, and for like two years. We've like been in discussions with them for so long to do this project together. And we didn't know what this project was at that stage. We just knew that like we need to partner. And then now they're super supportive of the project and like they will push for the project and all that. So those things are so much more important than like just picking a platform. Like we did so much due diligence for this project. Like uh, we partnered with Epidemic Sound uh, that's gonna like we're gonna use their music for the behind the scenes series and they will push for the project and crowdfunding campaign in their channels. We're gonna use like Kickstarter, uh, they will push for the project in their channels. Um, Maddie has his channel, we have our channel. It's like finding those natural collaborations are super important, so that's why we picked kickstarter because they were interested in that and yeah they've helped us so much like just planning everything so film industry markets talked a little bit about those and the reason why i think they are what you need like anybody that's like a little bit uncertain of like what the film industry is they should go to the film industry markets First of all, you have like you don't even need a project to go there. You could go there as an observer or just like any industry pass. Like it's just a regular conference type of thing. But you learn so much from it. You have like, tons of talks which are relevant to you. You got uh, just the whole industry there so you can network with everybody. Uh, you can get to pitch to everybody. Like it's a great place to be. For networking, if you want to do co-production, it's great. Um, if you do want to pitch, though, the film markets, like usually they don't pick projects that don't have, first of all, enough money. And I don't know exactly how much, but I would think like if you have 30% of the budget secured, then that's a big bonus. Uh, but other than that, you need to have your own country on board which would mean like film commissioner or your uh, broadcaster or something to support your project. That will like make your chances like way, way bigger. Uh, and you need a trailer and you need to be ready to pitch, uh, which can be intimidating, but it's just a great place to network. And I just like, like the markets that I like is like Sheffield Dog Fest, Hot Dogs. I haven't I don't think I've been to the IDFA forum, but I, I, I think it's really good um, f from what I've heard, but I, I don't know from my own experience. Um, I think it, American film market is probably good. I haven't been there. I think, what else? Uh, Leipzig is supposed to be really good. I think Berlinale is also good. Um, what else? CPH docs also good. Yeah, but check those out. If you have any other suggestions, just leave a comment about them. Um, but they're really good. Like they are so good for networking. Uh, do you do any films completely by yourself, producing, shooting, editing, etc.? Um, like most of the projects that I made until I started working with my brother, I did that way. 
uh, that project I still did everything besides producing myself uh, so it, it really comes down to what's necessary for this project like from having I've worked so much in TV and like commercials and all that and, and that's always collaborative and I don't feel a need for that in my projects I just want to go out and shoot by myself usually yeah, so working with like the Kino project with Maddie, that's actually something different where I actually work with a DP and we work differently. But usually I would actually just go out and shoot it just because it's it's more practical and easier just because I come from a DOP background. But it's really nice to be able to collaborate. But it also comes down to just like having a team which works and like this is a viable way of doing it. Because if you don't have the resources for it, it doesn't make sense at all. Um, yeah, so it just comes down to that. I think that you should be able to do, like do anything uh, without being like restrained by funding. That's the best way to get things done, at least. Um, yeah, and also like crucial to get funding, you need to get reputation. You need to get into probably festivals to get a bus. Um, and you need to network and make friends with people. That's <laughs> that's how you get funding. Like actually knowing people and them knowing you and your work will better your chances so freaking much. And going to festivals helps in that. Yeah. So for like audiences, not so much. But for that, it's super important. Um, Levi Pittman, I want to hear about getting people interested in your film. Show that it would be valuable, like TV show, movie or whatever, in, uh, and in turn get attention of a larger distributor. Yeah, so there's a couple of ways. Like attaching an experienced or like big name to the project is a big thing. I think that's like super important to have especially like if you do any type of like ambitious project where you want to do like the Oscars or something like that you need to have like big people behind you like big experienced executive producers all that they really matter um, then like another thing like f to get people interested be first to market with something so do something about some current affairs that hasn't been done before like there's for instance if you were the first film about Syria and war you would get sold it's that easy like usually like first to market wins and then like that doesn't mean like it's the best film about that but you always have an upper hand if you're that film and if you're also a good film then like even better um, and you also need to build like a, a strong audience that's what we focus a lot on like actually having people that care about your work will make it more sustainable i think long term and it will show people that uh, you're good at what you do uh, you also need like a pitch deck you need a trailer that's really strong uh, you need to practice pitching so it, it becomes natural and not salesy um, you need to use like social media and crowdfunding to give like uh, proof of being something um, but it could also be like you don't have to have like social media or everything doesn't have to be digital but you need to show proof of audience and that could be somewhere else like offline as well um, but you also should like try to get a festival hit or a viral hit those two would be different things like having a festival hit would be getting all the uh, the laurels and all that to put on your posters from the right festivals not any festival having those uh, are valuable but it could also be just like a big viral hit on the internet um, you could also look like annuals like black history month uh, pride week like all those things try to like pitch this film would be important then um, also think about like local or national do you have something that's like okay so for Sweden this story makes total sense so let's tell this story uh, that's super important for the broadcasters at least 
like Swedish public broadcasters usually like have a bigger pot of Swedish films, so it's easier to pitch those. Um, for distributors, I think you need to build a track record um, to make yourself interesting. Um, and you need to kind of deliver on things. Searching for Sugarman, I don't know if people have heard about that film, Oscar film. Supposedly, it's the only film that Swedish public television has earned any money back from uh, of all documentaries through all of time. So that kind of tells you how much a documentary actually makes. One film in like 100 years or whatever. Not a good market. Okay, so crowdfunding. Let me just show you a short version of the trailer so you know what I'm talking about here. We'll be right back. I started filmmaking just because it was super What's up with this? One more time. If it doesn't work now, then I don't know what to do. I started filmmaking just because it was super fun. Like everything has gone wrong. Uh, they wouldn't check our luggage. So that's just see that sign, it's a Grizzly Valley. Yes! <laughs> but there came a point where I needed to see how other people did their filmmaking process and that's really what this is for you guys. We're making a film about a faded gold rush town called Kino City. Some people call us hippies, call hillbillies, dirty, but this is our home. Along the way, we give you our best tips on how you can take your filmmaking to the next level. Will Smith, Scorsese, Spielberg, all those. Uh, and I'm going <laughs> in short. Um, yeah, my Hawaii shirt. So help us make our film. In return, we'll help you make yours. What would you do if you saw a bear coming out of here, right? Be a part of a documentary about how a documentary is made. Okay. I think it was a bit loud in the beginning. Sorry for that. Um, yeah, so I've done, this is the third crowdfunding campaign, right? Yeah. It's freaking hard to fund your film with crowdfunding. And I think if you don't build up a big following or something, like raising real money is super hard. But on like the flip side, you could actually use a crowdfunding campaign to build that audience if you do it like in the proper way. But there are like so many things that, that like could go wrong. And like the first campaign I did, I think we made like 400 bucks. So that was not a success. <laughs> we had to do it all over a little bit later. Uh, and then we actually got like 13K or something, but it was just like a totally failure in the beginning. Um, but the good thing about crowdfunding is that it really really like gathers an audience and make your project feel like it's actually moving now i get the same feeling just off of making like videos on the youtube channel about the project as well but there's something about like having a crowdfunding campaign um, so what did i learn and what did i want to change for, like from having made uh, previous ones and then like how am I thinking about it now so like crucial for crowdfunding is have a great trailer I don't know if that was so great but like have the ambition of having it that's crucial and also you need to have partners to get reach like whoever that would be I told you about like like we collaborated with Maddie because we felt like we could actually fund us collaborating with Maddie could be funding or funded through working with Maddie. So we could actually fund him actually getting paid to work with us through the crowdfunding campaign. That's how we thought about it. And then like working with Kickstarter that helps so much to get eyes on the project. And then working with Epidemic, it not only helps like the project in itself to get like uh, the music made and, and all that, but it's like an interesting collaboration, I think, in terms of like having people to, to collaborate with. Uh, and hopefully that results in like us being able to sit down with the composers and make like the soundtrack for the, for the film or something in the end. But it's just like having those partners and, and getting the reach through them and through you and collaborating in that sense is crucial. 
for the Pearl of Africa, we worked similarly, but we worked with like LGBTQ organizations and also got that reach. And that was like massive. That was why we turned like 400 bucks into actually getting funded. Um, but also a big change, like for the Pearl of Africa, we crowdfunded Cleo's sex reassignment surgery in Thailand which was like, okay, it was not the film, it was actually a cause that they could be part of. And that was what we felt was interesting at the time. Now we try to like switch that to like, okay, so just look at the audience. What would the audience want anyways? So looking at educational stuff that we and Maddie do, just looking at like what type of packages or things could we put together to have in this crowdfunding campaign, rather than having like more t-shirts, t-shirt on sale right now, confused African, go check out, yeah, somewhere in the playlists. Th that thing, I th feel like it's not so interesting. So we looked at the audience, what do you guys need? And then we put together like what we felt would be possible from that. Uh, that's like a big change that we made. So everything is like courses and uh, lots and all those things that like people buy anyways from us. But now we put it in a discounted package and try to make it like as this thing that people actually wants to buy. And that's been proven like really good for us because like we don't have that many backers Not right now it's like 70 backers but still like most people like there is like one i think that bought the lower perks like all of them are like a little bit more expensive because there's value there so i think that was a big thing um and also like build an audience that actually enjoys your work and where you're like giving value back like trying to build that real relationship to people that's what's going to make people actually trust you and, and do things so that was crucial to like build this audience not try to like uh, leech off of it and then like bring out something that they actually want to buy or you want to buy that's what our thought on it was um, and then like set a goal that you think you can actually get to rather have it low and have like it grow so have like milestones that you might or what do we call it or what do kickstarter call it let's see oh, they have like a term for it but i don't remember it anyway you have like these milestones on the way for instance for us it's like Okay, so 25,000 would be like the first part, but then it would be 45,000. We have a different part and then 65,000. We would make a whole feature doc on, on this behind the scenes stuff. So have those, like it could grow, but this is like where we're starting. Um, and then like pre-race as much as you can. Big thing. Like that was one of the biggest thing that like we learned from <laughs> the previous uh, crowdfunding campaign because the first one we didn't do it obviously like 4,000 or 400 sorry uh, so we pre-raised for this one we pre-raised for the last one and just because you get that first initial push you actually can start to get the ball rolling early on uh, so that's really important to focus on uh, and I've heard a lot about this like from different uh, like different opinions on it I think you should make like PR and have like an influencer strategy and all that and like you need to send that out but according to for instance Kickstarter it's more like when you're about to reach your goal that's when you need to make a push for like PR and that sort of thing um, because there's probably so many that do it earlier so I don't know hopefully like we get PR if you can get PR, that's amazing, but I wouldn't count on it, on raising the money. That's like a false, I think, uh, security. Uh, but you need to do that as well. Um, in general, I don't think it's worth the money. <laughs> like crowdfunding is, it's time consuming. It's like, there's better ways to make the money. But if you want to build an audience and you want to build engagement around your project, then crowdfunding is awesome. Um, yeah and I think for the first film 
crowdfunding was actually what made it possible for us to shoot the film. So it was crucial. Like we didn't get funding. Usually that's the case in like development stages. You have a hard time funding films. So I would say like building an audience to actually be able to crowdfund, it's going to give you so much more security in terms of funding films. Yeah, but also like thinking about alternative ways to kind of bring revenue in at an earlier stage than when your film is sold. Because you really need that to cover production costs, um, even if you don't get grants or anything. Um, let's see. Would you consider working with brands for funding a doc ethical considerations? Actually, yeah, I would. Uh, a friend of mine did one with Adidas that my brother did the, like the launching of, uh, the, the festival launch and PR for. Uh, that was interesting because they didn't have a lot of money, but they had like decent amount of money f to make a film. But just like making a film like that with a brand, I think as long as you do something that's totally in line with the brand. So for instance, it's Adidas. They made a film about a boxer uh, on Cuba. Fine. Nothing in terms of restraints there. Uh, maybe they have opinions and, and all that, but it's nothing different than like a film commissioner. They have tons of opinions and especially like broadcasters and all that. Um, like even now, when I'm pitching to TV, I need to change the pitch for it to go up to the higher people. So like for the first initial like project manager, then it's okay, this is okay. But change this and I can present it to the, to the board or whatever. So it's crucial wherever you are, it's crucial to be able to switch and change with the funders and understand what they need. Uh, not be so into your own project and all that. Uh, what happens after documentary films are shown at the festivals? Like, do they all get bought uh, by Netflix? I mean, uh, what is the lifetime of those films? I would say most films do not sell. Most films just go, they vanish. So, like, the ones that do get sold, they're very, very few. Uh, like, the... It used to be different with Netflix. Like, they used to buy a ton. But now they have a lot of deals with, for instance, like Fox Searchlight or whatever the big uh, movie houses in Hollywood are. And then they buy all their films and that type of thing. But now there's so much changed. Like you have aggregators, like we used uh, a Canadian one. And then they pitch like, I don't know how many projects. It's like two projects a month or something, I think, to pitch to Netflix. So it's very limited. And I think it's much harder today. I think you need to have some traction and need to be like a film that there's not too many others of or it's a super popular category. And it needs to be like cinematic type of films. But it's pretty hard. Like you don't sell generally. Like it's really hard to sell your film um, and to make proper money off it. It's, it's like really hard. But look at the markets first like if you can sell your film at the market you can sell it at the festivals once it premieres if you can't sell it at a market probably can't sell it once it premieres like it's that simple it, they are good at seeing the potential in films uh, and they make their minds up uh, as well but uh, on the other hand like i have a friend who uh, almost didn't get into idfa she got into idfa uh, eventually and then her film was in this like back category somewhere and then she won the audience prize and then it's like this big thing and everybody wants to buy it so that could happen as well but it's very rare so you need to have like a type of audience winning film or you need to rally people around your film to get the audience award because those awards are worth like tons when you try to sell your film but you don't get rich off of like a sale like that but it's so much better if you win the awards like just being in a competition program isn't even enough um, you need to win awards most of the time 
Um, let me just run through like my thoughts on like getting funded, like some some key things. Whoa. So I mentioned this, but like you really need to like listen to people. You need to be able to adapt to what they say and you need to hear them like what do they look for because all the funders they're going to look for different things so they're not going to be looking for like whatever you're after that's not the thing that they are looking for if it's lgbt then it's certain criteria for that if it's something about uh, black history it's something on that like you need to adapt to whatever they're looking for and what their agenda is uh, and you need to know like film finance how it works so like research how do you fund a documentary uh, and look at um, like what the the ways are that you write a budget like look at our budget uh, that you can download on learndocumentary.com but just review other budgets as well and like cross examine them and and see how they are uh, are made cuz like all the funders they they don't like a creative person that don't like like you know the unstructured producer type of person like you need to be structured and you need to know everything uh, it's easier for us because andre is doing the producing and i'm more creative type of of person so i don't need to like be that structured person and in the meetings but i do need to pitch everything like i do need to be clear and do the pitching like most of the time it's me pitching but he's doing like all the production in terms of like budgeting and doing all the negotiations all those things so then the pitching area is where it's more about the story and more about like getting people involved you know involved and interested and then you need to be on point with that so yeah Either you do both or you collaborate with people. Uh, another super important thing is like deliver on your promises. So for instance, now uh, this whole project in Kino, we had, we got a small grant to go and shoot like the first stuff that we've shot. Um, that's actually not just Kino. It's actually also in like Lofoten Islands and it's in uh, PTO in Sweden. So it's like a bigger project, but then we also got funded to do the bits behind the scenes series that we did previously uh, and then also to launch the crowdfunding campaign so if you can get that money and you have goals like whatever we for instance said that we would get in terms of like okay this is the amount of uh, viewers we would get this is the amount of money we would crowdfund if you don't deliver on those promises chances are you won't get the next funding and usually they're divided into like you get this first and then you get this and it builds up uh, along the way so really deliver on whatever you promise and don't promise things you can't deliver um, and then you need to keep it like realistic all the time like sure don't over budget but don't under budget uh, and also keep everybody in the loop on things and like they need to understand like what you're going through whatever that is like if you have a problem then let them know and uh, probably they can help you but then like a big thing that people skimp on is like experience so sure you want to be like realistic with what you have and a lot of people won't go on board on projects just like that but really try to attach experienced people to your project the more experienced people you have, the bigger leverage you have uh, towards the funders. Uh, whatever type of capacity that is, but look at how you can involve people. Just as a mentor is more than nothing. Uh, just that experience, it's worth a lot to them. Uh, and then also like look at all the legal stuff, like protect yourself and have the right legal stuff in order. That goes to like release forms and um, yeah, anything like hire uh, an attorney or whatever it is to get all the contracts signed if you haven't signed contracts before then you need to know what they say and like what it means uh, all that um, but then also don't be afraid to partner up with people like do partner with other people to make your film that are more experienced or the same experience but complement each other um, yeah that would be like my like big things uh, let me check some last questions here um, 
Are docs considered editorial works or uh, not commercial? Are docs considered editorial works? Like commercial in what sense? Like it's uh, it's commercial when you sell it to a Netflix, then you need all the legal stuff to be, you know, release forms, all that needs to be in order. All the rights for any archive material, all that needs to be in order, all the music, all that. But in terms of like having, I don't know what it's called, but you have like an artistic freedom in certain ways of like using material and all that. Sometimes you get away with like, stealing <laughs> archive footage or something like that but most of the time you don't so uh, i would just like try to keep it as clean as possible just like youtube it's just the same like it, it's a pain in the ass but you should keep it super clean in terms of the material uh, will you ever make a course on film pitching to brands yeah probably probably make some course on like it's just like in limbo now in terms of documentaries for for brands we're making like two projects now which are are pretty good but like it's hard with the documentary projects to get like good work i feel i don't know how many projects there are it feels like it's like it's so limited so i'm thinking i, I would probably need to make it broader than that but let, let us know like what type of pitching uh, of commercial projects you would like us to talk about because i'm so focused on like the, the documentary stuff but i've done all the other stuff as well for brands uh, but it's just that that's what be, what's been my focus and like niche for a while now for like the past two years i think so i'm stopped like i stopped getting calls about those types of projects most of the time I just get the calls for the documentary style commercials nowadays, which is good. Like you should pick your niche and that's probably what I would focus on in the course. Like talk more about like you needing to niche yourself yeah, because they look at like they just want to hire you for the same thing and same thing and same thing. Could be boring, but that's the way it is. Um, How much time do you usually plan uh, to run your crowdfunding campaigns? Uh, do you prefer an ongoing campaign or a fixed amount of time for donations? I think this is kind of hard. I think for, for urgency, because that's what everything is about. Like having a fixed time is good. Uh, we chose 40 days, I think. And that was just because if we felt like, okay, 40 days is a good time. Uh, one month is like that's good but i would say like 40 yeah that's probably a sweet spot because you want to have the urgency so if you don't have for instance perks that are limited and if you don't have these uh, like windows for sales then you don't drive an urgency so i think that's really important to have that we have right now we have like 48 hours i don't know how many how many hours there are left let me check uh, here we go 18 hours left for certain perks and that's just to drive urgency and that's really important uh, all this is like kickstarter themselves have said this to us so we based it on that uh, and then like having limited packages for instance this perk has only this amount of people that are able to buy this and then it goes up the price that type of urgency is also really important to drive people to actually go in uh, and if you don't have that you risk that people are they don't feel the urgency to do it now so they skip on it and maybe they remember later that they wanted it but you need to kind of drive that uh, to happen now and that's like a crucial thing more than I think the time. But the time is also just because it's a pain in the ass to do it for longer. So 40 days is pretty much what you <laughs> what you want to do in the end. Because it's like hard work all the time. Um, let me see. Jason, did you hear about Pete? Yeah, I did hear about Pete. Super sad. Um, yeah, like I haven't said anything about it, but I'm so like, 
when I saw, because Pete was one of the, always came to this channel, always promoted this channel, it's super sad. Uh, he died from cancer, uh, like rest in peace recently. It wasn't that, like a couple of weeks ago, I think. I don't know how how you would kind of do like an honor of that. Uh, I just feel it's super sad. Uh, it kind of made me think about like how because these things like looking at like people behind a screen, it's kind of hard like to to picture that until you meet people. Now I've met a lot of you guys, so it, it's become like real now. But when you start out, you don't see that. And with Pete, I felt like I actually knew the guy because he was always commenting on on the videos, which like he was so passionate and supportive all the time. And I think that's like it's so amazing to have like that type of following. And that's really why this is fun to me as well, that people actually care. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, that did not go as it was supposed to go um yeah i don't know how would you even honor somebody like that i'm gonna think about it and then maybe i'll do something uh, so let me just finish off with james here uh, i came into this convo late but you said you enjoy filming solo uh, when you travel and film by yourself do you typically uh, film for the duration of a visa how long do you stay capturing footage usually i just stay like the m amount of money or time i have i like going alone and i think this is like a good practice for anybody the reason why i think people should go alone like now i feel confident to work with other people but in the beginning it's so easy to hide behind the team and not really get into whatever you're trying to make, like get into the story or get close to the people and get too comfortable. Like you go home and you have your uh, whatever, if it's coffee, beer, hang out in the evening type of thing with your uh, crew, rather than actually spending even more time with the people that you're hanging out with and filming and building close connections to. That's what I think is like the biggest reason for me to, I would go alone just to build that. I think that's like a big reason to do it. But nowadays, like I feel confident enough that I can get that without it, but I'm always going to mix it up. Like sometimes I do that, sometimes I do it with somebody else. So it's just a, a matter of like finding a way to also surprise yourself and find a way to make things just be unexpected for you. Because that's when, at least me, I'm the best when anything happens and, and all that. Um, yeah, I think that's going to be it for this Q&A thing. Pretty long. So I'll see you guys uh, and check out the Kickstarter. We're doing pretty well. 72 backers. Go Sweden or us. See you guys. Um, new video sometime this week, probably Thursday ish. See ya. How do you stop this thing?